Thanks, Max. So it was 1995, and I was out of a job. I'd been working for a grad student at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. I was a junior. And uh, I worked for him over the summer. It was a great experience. I got to sit in the lab and just crank out code for computers and robots. Uh, and I found out that he was graduating, and so I was out of work. So I looked up some local opportunities, and fortunately, I was able to find another opening on campus at the Medical Robotics Lab. It was also called the Mr. Cass Lab, of course, short for Medical Robotics and Computer Assisted Surgery. I didn't have any particular interest in surgical robotics or computer-aided medicine. I was just looking for a way to keep coding instead of working fast food. Now, Mr. Cass Lab was founded by Tony DeJoya. Uh, Tony was a CMU engineer who then ended up going to Harvard Medical School, and he became a really prominent orthopedic surgery, surgeon here in Pittsburgh. And he also co-founded the lab because he was interested in robotics. And Branko Yaramaz was a biomedical engineer that worked at the lab, and I found out after the interview process that I got the job and would be signed to him. And our task was to develop a computer-assisted surgery simulator uh, and range of motion planner for total hip replacement surgery. Now, total hip replacement, for those of you who don't know, this is your hip joint. Uh, usually the way the hip socket works is you have a layer of cartilage over your femoral head and you have a layer of cartilage in your hip socket and allows the bones to move very freely relative to one another. Unfortunately, due to arthritis, this cartilage layer starts to wear down. The bone starts to rub on bone and it starts to hurt a lot. So what we need to do is we need to replace the diseased surfaces with metal and plastic bearings. This way you can move freely and there's no more pain. It's pretty key, though, to get the components in the right orientation. You can imagine if you put these things in wrong, that the implants can start to bang on one another. It can lead to implant failure, but also potentially to dislocation. So how do we avoid dislocation? Well, the way it was done before the advent of computer-assisted surgery, we had the type of planning that was done on, uh, at, with acetate templates on top of an x-ray. So basically, you would do the 2D x-ray, it gets a front picture of the joint, and then you can use these guides to kind of roughly align, but mostly for sizing, uh, figure out what you were going to do going into the surgery, and then from there, you made your decisions. Within the surgery, you use really crude mechanical guides. You can see here on the picture on the right, uh, this mechanical guide essentially was used to align the tool to the floor of the operating room. It didn't take into account any variability in the patient's anatomy, and you had to make assumptions about how the patient was aligned on the operating table. And you can imagine if you have a 300-pound patient on the operating table, it's pretty difficult to know exactly where their pelvis might be. So how do we solve this problem? Well, um, the project we worked on was called HIPNAV, and HIPNAV included a preoperative planner and an interoperative guidance system. And the preoperative planner was my work, uh, what we did is we developed a CT-based planner that allowed us to build 3D shapes of the pelvis and the femur in order to accurately place and align the components, and we could make adjustments according to the native patient's anatomy. And after we did that alignment, we could fine-tune things by basically doing a, a preoperative range of motion simulation. We could move the joint through a range of motion and see how the positions of the components and the selection of the various components would affect the range of motion for the patient. So that's great. We have a great plan for the surgeon. It's patient-specific. How are we going to make it happen in the operating room? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the mechanical guides because you can imagine they don't work so well. Then we outfit the operating room with an optical tracking camera, kind of like your Microsoft Connect, but this was 10, 15 years earlier than that. Um, we attach sensors, like motion capture sensors, to the pelvis. We attach it to the tools as well. And then what we can do is we can plug all of that information into a computer system that allows us to do all the math for the surgeon and then basically tell the surgeon whether or not the, his insertion tools are aligned incorrectly or correctly according to where the pelvis is. And this is how it worked in the operating room. This is Shadyside Hospital. This is Dr. DeJoy on the right. He has his sensors equipped to both his instruments and to the patient's pelvis. We've got the tracking camera off to the right or off to the left. It's monitoring the positions of the tools, and he sees his readout in the operating room. Now, the capability to track the pelvis and the instruments in the operating room was unprecedented. And what it allowed us to do is research not about guiding the cup, but actually in measuring current practice. And so uh, our team won the 1998 Hip Society Award and the ability to show that indeed the assumptions that were made before the advent of this type of technology 
were all wrong. The pelvis was not fixed on the operating room table. You needed to take into account patient-specific anatomy, and you also needed to track your tools in the operating room so you can know you did a good job. In fact, the type of research that Tony Ambranco did along with others in the field kind of revolutionized the industry, and you can see that uh, Tony Ambranco could literally be considered uh, the authors of the book on computer-assisted surgery. Now, Tony and Branco didn't want to stop there. They weren't satisfied with uh, just uh, writing some research papers and doing some good work. They wanted to get this out there. And so how do you do that? Well, you make, form a company. So Caserta was spawned out of Carnegie Mellon, uh, and its mission was to fund uh, and uh, make the FDA approval for this product happen. Um, the idea was that we were going to place this in all the operating room, and we were going to revolutionize surgery. I had a couple friends that worked for Cosurgica, and I can know firsthand how hard they worked in trying to prepare the applications. In fact, they worked so hard, and they hit so many dead ends that they pivoted. And what they ended up doing is instead of trying to build the application themselves, they decided to partner with an existing navigation system that was used for sinus surgery, and they tried to outfit the HipNav software on that system. Unfortunately, that didn't work. The company's funding ran down. My friends got burnout, and they shelved the company for at least a little while. Later, I was taken to lunch by Branco. I was still working for the lab at the time, uh, and he took me out to lunch at the Church Brew Works. Church Brew Works is, is a fine establishment here in Pittsburgh, uh, and we uh, had a lunch of pierogies with a, a colleague of his named Craig Markovitz. Craig Markovitz was a, a local business guy. He was actually instrumental in establishing Cosurgica as a business, and he was an advisor to Tony and Branco, uh, and they, they sat me down over pierogies and uh, talked to me about what they wanted to do. What they wanted to do was to give it one last go with Cosurgica. They were going to fund the company, they were going to shoot for FDA approval, build it, sell it, take over the world. So they asked me if they wanted me to join them. After all the excitement with Cosurgica and seeing my friends get burnt out and leave the company, I said, of course, I'm in. We worked with Cosurgica. Uh, we worked on the HypNav project for a number of years. Uh, we tried to build the FDA approval packet we brought in consultants for regulatory issues. Uh, we debugged software. Uh, we did sales calls. We did everything that we could do. Couldn't get it off the ground. Didn't have any major investors. Didn't make any sales. We even went further in doing uh, alternative research, trying to get research grants. We tried shoulder surgery. We tried ACL reconstruction surgery. We even tried fetal cardiac interventions, which is essentially operating on unborn babies' hearts. That didn't work either, uh, but it helped keep the company alive. Fortunately, this is the Cosurgica.com webpage today. But we left the legacy. Even though Cosurgica didn't work out, what we do have is now a sea change in computer-assisted orthopedics. If you search for computer-assisted orthopedic surgery, this is what you see today as opposed to nothing. Um, every major implant manufacturer is associated with computer guidance. There's robotic systems that will put it in your hip. We helped make a change in the industry. Now. Mr. Cass, the lab that we were working at, was medical robotics and computer assisted surgery. So let's talk a little bit about medical robotics. If you think about medical robotics, this is what you think of. This is the Da Vinci robot by Intuitive Surgical. It is impressive technology. It is extremely capable. It is incredibly accurate. It's fun to play with. If you ever get a chance to do a demo of a Da Vinci robot, I recommend it highly because it's really fun. Um, it's also very large and very expensive. Back in the late 90s, there was another robot that was large and expensive. This was called the RoboDoc robot. This was also used for hip replacement surgery, but it was made for reaming out the femoral part of the surgery. Uh, the surgeon would basically sit back and watch the robot do the work. The, lit the robot literally stood between the surgeon and the patient. So this begs the question, why do all these robots have to be so big? Robots don't have to be big. What if you could fit the robot in the palm of your hand? This is Gabe Brisson. Gabe was actually a grad student with me at CMU. Um, while I was working for the Mr. Cass lab, I went to school part-time in the robotics department. Gabe was a PhD student, and he was also assigned to medical robotics. So this idea was Gabe's. Gabe said, well, what if I had a robot that I could hold in my hand as a surgeon, but the, I could control the robot by moving it around, but the surgeon would make up for my mistakes. The surgeon would improve my precision. And that's exactly what he proposed as his thesis presentation. Uh, this was the concept drawing. We have uh, the camera again, same sort of tracking camera off to the right. It's monitoring the bones. It's monitoring the surgeon's tools. But this time, the surgeon's tool is smart. 
The surgeon's tool knows when it should cut. It knows when it should not cut. It can start, it can stop, it can slow down. It knows what the plan is, and it achieves that plan by adapting to the surgeon's motions. Gabe called it the PFS, Precision Freehand Sculptor. I didn't think it would work. Luckily, though, Tony, Branco, and Craig thought it would work. They approached CMU about licensing the technology, and they did, and they created a company called Blue Belt Technologies. It was named for the Beltway that here in Pittsburgh that is closest to Carnegie Mellon. So Craig was my CEO at Kasurjka at the time, and uh, it was well within his right to say, hey, Costa, uh, you're going to work on PFS too. So I ended up becoming the first employee of Blue Belt, and even though I didn't think that the, uh, the technology would work originally, it now became my job to make it work. So I moved over out of our Kasurjka office into a new office with Craig over on the corner of Friendship Park, and jo Gabe joined us in a part-time manner, and we started writing code, and we started building robots. So this is the first Blue Belt sponsored prototype for PFS. This is called the Ugly Tool. You can see that it's fairly aptly named. Um, this tool was great as a proof of concept, but it would pinch your fingers if you held it wrong. The next tool is called the TPFS. It's obviously much more attractive. Unfortunately, surgeons didn't like to use it because it weighed five pounds. Also, if you ran it for more than a couple minutes, it would start to heat up and burn your hands. So we had lots of wet paper towels wrapping around to try to get through our experiments. So this wasn't going to work out. But it allowed us to get the research more advanced, it allowed us to do some cadaver trials, and it allowed Gabe to get his PhD research completed. Once Gabe had his PhD, he decided he was going to go and move to California and work for Intuitive and build Da Vinci robots, ironically enough. So what we did is we hired some more engineers and we built some more prototypes. Fortunately, Craig was a master at keeping these small companies funded through looking at opportunities in local economic development like the Life Sciences Greenhouse here in Pittsburgh, but also in sponsored research coming from companies. This is the NPFS tool. This was an adapted uh, tool for our technology that was applied to spine surgery. There were a few doctors at Allegheny General that were interested in applying this for spine in order to protect the spinal cord when you're doing a laminectomy procedure. We also uh, found opportunities working with uh, Johnson & Johnson and their implant company, Depew, uh, building yet another knee prototype that we called the KneeFS. But again, we still didn't have an FDA-approved product. We were a small company chasing funding, just trying to stay alive to develop the technology, so we chased other opportunities. Uh, we did some work in some early medical augmented reality in the project we called Image Overlay. We also got some grant funding in order to develop a computer-assisted hematoma evacuation tool. This is basically suck the blood clot out of your brain if you had head trauma, and we call this one the brain poker. All right. Can we play the video, please? Can you click that? Oops. All right, they'll edit that one out in post, I guess. Is that, can you play that video? Can you click it? All right, sorry about that. Uh, this was our last go as a little startup company. Uh, we were trying to promote the PFS not as an end application. We just couldn't get uh, enough funding, enough wherewithal to do the FDA route to build our own product. And so our idea is we were going to promote this as a technology that you can bolt on to existing navigation systems. So by this point, there are a lot of companies doing computer-assisted surgery, and we wanted to provide the technology. We didn't want to necessarily build a system from the ground up. So this is our way of demonstrating how PFS worked. You can see that the tool is extending and retracting, starting and stopping in order to conform to, in this case, a partial knee replacement plan. All right. So, we worked long and hard. We did a lot of different prototypes. We tried to keep the company lasting as long as we could, but eventually our funding ran out. Fortunately, Craig was able to find one more opportunity for us. There was a local super angel investor that was able to fund Blue Belt with an A round and basically take us out of the research lab and make us a real company. And here's that real company back in 2010. Our mission was to actually create PFS as an end user application, get the approvals that we needed, and sell this. 
Now, of course, the company got bigger from the three-person group that we started off with. Um, and so with more people and more resources, you need more money. So in 2011, we had to get another round of funding. This time, we were actually purchased by uh, HealthPoint Capital, which was a private equity group out of New York. HealthPoint Capital allowed us to staff up and focus and really concentrate on getting our FDA application in so that we could sell this thing. Uh, one of the things that HealthPoint did was they brought in a, a new CEO that had some more international sales experience. His name was Eric Timko. Eric is out of Minneapolis, but he was okay because he was from Pittsburgh. He grew up in Saxonburg. He's from Butler County. And uh, he uh, was okay with us because he was as, almost as big a Steeler fan as my mom. The next year, after lots of hard work, getting our European approvals, which for us, it was a little easier to do that first. Uh, we did our first demand in Belgium. Uh, off to the right, you see me and Branko and Eric and, and uh, Adam and uh, John are from our European group and also Dr. Bellman's front and center who performed the first live Navio taste on a patient. At the end of that year, we did all the paperwork necessary for our FDA approval. And in fact, uh, that FDA approval paperwork included studies that showed that we were actually as good, if not better, than the big robot competition that was out there. And we were far better than any of the mechanical instruments that our technology was intended to replace. The next year, we started to blow up our Minneapolis operations. Uh, we actually had a manufacturing and a sales corporate operations center in Minneapolis, and so we were kind of a two-headed monster. Pittsburgh stayed research and development. Uh, Minneapolis built and, and sold the units. We also did our 100th case. The following year, we had climbed to 500 cases. This is solely the Pittsburgh group here. You can see that we we're getting bigger, getting better. We we're advancing into other areas of surgery. We went back to total hip replacement surgery. We went forward into total knee replacement surgery. And we finally had enough critical mass to take the obligatory trip on the Gateway Clipper. <laughs> and by our thousandth case in 2015, we were a real deal in orthopedics. People were starting to talk about us. We were getting analysts to visit us, our booth at the, local, uh, at the global conferences in orthopedics. Uh, so the only thing left for Blue Belt, we were selling product, we were getting surgeries done on patients, was market validation. That's Craig and Branco. And the market validation came in 2016. Blue Belt was purchased by Smith & Nephew. Smith & Nephew was the number four orthopedic company in the world. And they've assimilated us. We are now a year in. Um, but there was still one more personal milestone that I had to achieve. My dad getting a Navio knee here in Pittsburgh. So this talk is supposed to be about revolutions. Um, I can't claim to be any kind of a revolutionary. As I said, I didn't believe in the idea at first. But I think that what you can do is you can identify a great group of people. And if there is a revolutionary idea out there, you can glom onto this great group and you can get together and you can start a revolution and make it work. Thank you very much.